my pleasure today to introduce Paul Waskoff. Paul has a BS in uh, physics from uh, Resnor Polytech, and he has an MS and PhD from also from Resler. Upon leaving RPI, Paul joined the Francis Ritter Magnet Lab at MIT, and within a few years, he moved to the just started MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center, where he still works part time. At MIT, Paul developed a number of technologies to measure and monitor and control plasmas. Paul has written 211 research articles, presented 33 conference papers, and written chapters in three books. And if I search correctly, he has 11 patents. About 15 years ago, in response to a request for proposals from the MIT Energy Initiative, Paul proposed to study drilling into hard rock with a gyrotron beam. He found success with a low power gyrotron that he had at his disposal. He went on to study how this device could change how boreholes are, could be drilled into very deep hot rock where conventional boring drilling techniques struggle because of the high temperature. This technique should be able to reach depths in excess of 10 kilometers where the water is heated to supercritical temperatures in excess of 375 degrees C. That's enough to directly run a steam engine at the same temperatures that a coal-fired plant would heat it at. And the necessary conditions for placing such a uh, borehole can be found almost everywhere on Earth and there's minimal environmental impact. With that, I'll turn it over to Paul to explain microwave drilling and let him correct any mistakes I have made. All right. Uh, well, I spent my entire career almost uh, working on magnetic confinement fusion since the mid-1970s, and uh, primarily by uh, area expertise was uh, plasma diagnostics of the 100 plus million degree fusion plasma. And uh, this is how I got involved with high power microwave farm front sources. I did my PhD work on high power gas lasers, which were the thing in the 70s, with maybe a tenth of a percent efficiency. But we needed uh, the millimeter wave range or the farm front wavelength range to scatter from the hot plasma to make temperatures of the ions and the fusion product alpha particles uh, in the plasma very important in magnetic confinement to confine the product alpha particles to helium nuclei to uh, give more energy up to the plasma to keep it ignited. So that was a tough nut to crack. So 40 years later, I was still working on it. But finally, the gyrotron was invented, which is a very high power source of millimeter waves. And we needed to get to that wavelength longer than the device shielding length in the plasma, which occurs in infrared, far infrared in a millimeter or so. So uh, uh, the gyrotrons were initially invented to heat plasmas. They are high power sources that put high average power. And uh, on the present ETER project going up in uh, coverage France, uh, 24 one mega gyrotrons are being installed to heat it. Uh, and uh, there I developed technology and available commercially. And we bought one uh, for EATER or the EATER program bought one after my initial work showing that collective Thompson scattering would work. And there's one gyrotron going up on EATER for diagnostics of the fusion alpha particles. Uh, so that was my work. And actually it was uh, taken over by uh, a group in uh, Denmark and China is responsible for the port on ETER for getting installed. And I've more or less retired from that, but I am called to uh, consult. And I've been in Barcelona a couple of times to Europe to uh, advise on that, that part of the ETER program. Anyhow, looking for another area to get into, uh, uh, Ernie Moniz, who was the head of the energy initiative, the first head of the energy initiative at MIT, uh, well, Susan Hockfield, who was two presidents ago at MIT, started up the energy initiative, uh, put out a call for various technologies that are needed. And on that list, under geothermal, the number one item 
uh, was drilling. Drilling is a bottleneck to geothermal uh, energy right now. And so I caught on to it because here I was involved with uh, megawatt Jartron sources that are actually truly CW coherent sources of beamed energy. Uh, this Jartron puts out more average power than any laser available. Okay, you might think we have the highest power lasers uh, in inertial confinement research going on at Lawrence Livermore, and they made a breakthrough recently. But those lasers can only pulse maybe once or twice a day for a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. So there's not enough power to power a light bulb to light this room on average. You can't drill a hole in Now, what is that? Bulb. Is there something that's like a capacitor that's building up charge so it could just do it once? Uh, yeah, I'm building up uh, the energy one time. The glass laser technology they're using has thermal limits. It can't be uh, pulsed that rapidly. The glass has to cool down and whatever. It's not a technology that could put out high average power. They, they do need to uh, develop a different kind of laser system if they're going to make a power plant out of, the, out of this. Uh, uh, but mainly, I, but I was uh, aware of the charter technology. We could put one megawatt CW. Uh, the tubes are designed to go truly CW for many hours, though in the magnetic uh, fusion program, uh, typically they pulse for a second or so, and either is going to go for up to an hour. The tubes are have been tested up to those uh, timescales, one hour. I'm asking to run them 24 7 for <laughs> months yeah. or more. So that's a little bit of more engineering stuff, but they are designed to do that. They just haven't been done. That is one engineering aspect. And, well, uh, excuse me. Would you like questions while you're talking? Or would you like to hold them to the end? What do you prefer? Well, you could do it either way, but we'll make the talk longer. But, <laughs> we, you know, we have an hour and a half, and we're welcome to use it all. Okay. Uh, I have about 20 uh, view graphs here, which are fairly complicated. But uh, what, why don't we hold them to the end? That way you can get your thought coherently out. There yeah. And we can ask questions afterwards. Yeah. If, uh, okay. Uh, anyhow, let, let's go on with the uh, the talk. Enough of background here. So there's plenty of heat beneath our feet. Uh, uh, the Earth, uh, to its core, contains uh, 20 billion times more energy than the total energy consumption currently. So if we just tap into tenths of a percent, we could supply all mankind's energy needs for 20 million years. Uh, but currently, we're only accessing about a half percent of our annual needs. Uh, if we could drill uh, deeper, less costly wells, uh, deeper than about 10 kilometers, we could potentially replace all fossil fuel plants for base power. Uh, okay. All right. And basically, the concept of uh, engineered or enhanced geothermal system is we'd have a, a well that would uh, uh, pump in uh, cold fluid, one or more wells. This is simplified drawing. drawing. There'd be a heat transfer reservoir, which would flow the fluid through, and then we'd have another well extracting the hot fluid. The power plant on surface can be exactly as it is now for a fossil fuel power plant if we could get to a hot enough temperature. Uh, you know, a fossil fuel plant will burn coal or oil or gas or whatever at a temperature sufficient to heat steam to supercritical temperatures, about 400 degrees centigrade. Uh, to get to that temperature, you have to go much deeper than you can currently with uh, uh, mechanical drilling, uh, except unless you're near a volcano or some hot zone somewhere on Earth, like in the geyser air area in California. Uh, so advances are needed for deep drilling and heat transfer reservoir formation. Uh, okay. So this one's a little bit complicated, but I'm showing you a graph that on the vertical axis is showing the depth from the surface zero to 30 kilometer depth. And on the horizontal axis, I'm showing the temperature from uh, surface temperature to 800 degrees centigrade. Uh, and on this plot, uh, the blue curve is the average thermal gradient for Earth's crust. That's uh, an accepted number. If you look it up 
uh, and the references they'll say it's 25 to 30 degrees per kilometer depth on average. Of course, there are hot spots and cold spots under mount, mountain ranges, but on the average, this is the rate at which the uh, temperature increases the deeper you go. And I have uh, uh, indicated uh, three points here, five kilometer depth, 14 kilometer depth, and a 20 kilometer depth. At 14 kilometers, we get to that critical temperature for supercritical uh, steam, 374 degrees, 700 degree F. Uh, and uh, the red curve shows the uh, volume needed for 1 billion joules of energy. So 1 billion joules of energy corresponds to 278 kilowatt hours or about four charges of a Tesla Model 3. Uh, <laughs> so you can uh, see that the deeper you go, not only do you get hotter temperatures, but also the density of energy increases. So where it takes one cubic meter at five kilometers to hold a billion joules of energy, when you get to 14, it's only 0.85 cubic meters. So when you get to 20, only 0.4 cubic meters has that amount amount of energy. So that implies that, uh, you know, first of all, the high temperatures implies you could put a plant almost anywhere if you can drill deep to 20 kilometers near, uh, uh, near a populated area, near a city uh, where you need it, but not out way in the West where you have a hot spot. The higher density uh, increase in the crust indicates that you need smaller uh, volumes of a heat transfer reservoir. It can, it, it can be much smaller to extract energy that you need. And then another uh, plot here is the Carnot efficiency of converting heat to mechanical energy or to mechanical energy to produce electricity. So this is a theoretical maximum, uh, not actually uh, realized all the time, but you might get close to it. So at 14 kilometers, we could get to 14% Carnot efficiency. So by going deeper into the region beyond 10 kilometers, 10 to 20, you can locate a plant almost anywhere. You can uh, minimize the volume you need to uh, mine for heat, and you can build a much higher conversion efficiency plant. In fact, you can take the heat as it is to run a current uh, coal fire plant, but instead of having the burner, you get the high heat from underneath the plant. But everything else is the same on on the surface. Okay, current mechanical technology uh, has been around for 150 years since the 1850s in Pennsylvania, <laughs> and it's a totally mature uh, technology. In the 90s, they uh, uh, added diamond bit drills and whatever, but you're not going to see. Uh, any significant breakthroughs in mechanical drilling technology uh, of the kind that we need for uh, exploiting geothermal on a large scale. Uh, particularly uh, challenging for mechanical drills is drilling hard crystalline rock formations like granite and basalt, and that's what you have really deep. You don't have the sedimentary rock. And uh, the costs generally increase exponentially with depth. And generally, uh, they're, they're limited. The, the deepest hole ever drilled is the Kola superheated, uh, super deep hole, 12.3 kilometers on the Kola Peninsula, what's in Russia now, but it was done when it was the Soviet Union. And it took them 20 years, a couple of tries, and it had the financing behind it of the Cold War in the 70s. The US was also uh, drilling deep wells then too. There was, seemed to be a mini race to who could go real deep back then. Uh, but now it's abandoned in its camp. I think it's a tourist site. You can go see it. Uh, so it took infinite amount of dollars and uh, a really long time. But as I showed you, the sweet spot for depth is 14 kilometers. That's where we really want to go. And mechanical blue detox has never gone that deep. And I don't think it ever will. Okay. So a new approach, directed energy drilling. I know from my work in fusion energy, uh, which right now is challenged by the materials of the first wall of the reactors chamber because of the intense energy radiating 
into the reactor. The survivability of the first wall is a key issue. And a lot part of the future program is materials issue of how to get matter to survive under intense heat. And uh, so it's an easy uh, jump for me that if you have enough intense energy, you're going to destroy matter and you're going to melt it and vaporize it. I mean, the entire beam that misses the plasma damages the wall uh, in the reactor chamber. So uh, you can reduce uh, opening a hole in the crust to just an energy matter interaction. interaction. You don't need any mechanical components in there. And uh, this is a conception of it here. Uh, a waveguide brings in the beam of energy. It's launched at the end of the waveguide. The beam diffracts because the wavelengths are relatively long uh, to the size of the waveguide to make a hole larger than the waveguide. And uh, it can actually be guided by a glass wall because electromagnetic beams, like infrared beams and glass fibers that are only 10 microns diameter, if you scale the wavelengths a uh, factor of 1,000, uh, the glass fiber can uh, dimensions be scaled. And you get into the dimension range of a borehole. An 8-inch borehole, you know, a few millimeter wavelengths beam is a counterpart of fiber optic uh, guidance very efficiency. So as the beam diverges, it can become guided by the borehole itself for a distance. And uh, the beam uh, and melting, you need to get temperatures above 1200 degrees centigrade to melt. You have to get the temperature above 3000 degrees centigrade to vaporize. Uh, the hole uh, will build, vitrify the wall as you go down and make a casing as you open it up. 50% of the cost of drilling a mechanical well is the cost of the casing. And that's a critical technology, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, the one that broke apart in the fire. Well, we, here we propose we're going to do the casing uh, at the same time we open the hole to uh, the, the hole up. Uh, the drill rate would be approximately constant uh, because as long as you keep the intensity to be the same, it's only a uh, matter of keeping that power density on the material to keep vaporizing it. Uh, but you keep the vapor from condensing as it goes up. Yeah, well, there is a purge gas coming down collinear with the beam, and that quenches the vapor into smoke, just like a meteorite when it comes into the atmosphere and burns up. It's turned into nanoparticles. In fact, I spent a lot of time looking at that particular issue. There's no data <laughs> of that except the people that will study meteorite burn up. And I found a study done that uh, when you have a lot of air around it and it burns up, uh, the average particle size of meter burning up is about six nanometers. So basically what we would be doing is we'd be quenching the vapor quickly and be blowing up nanoparticle smoke. Uh, what rate approximately? Inches per something? Yeah, I'll be covering that, yeah. Okay, so uh, potential for depths at uh, 10 times lower cost, and I'm going to go over the, those numbers. Uh, well, let's see. Oh, how come? Here we go. It, it, it's oh, oh, there was a delay. Yeah, I didn't see it there. Oh, don't worry about there it. There you go. You guys can work on that. That happens. <laughs> I got to my smoke. <laughs> the millimeter waves are ideal uh, wavelength for this borehole range uh, because they're they fall between microwaves and the infrared in a range where the wavelength is short enough that it can be a beam in the dimensions of a borehole, which is typically on the order of eight inches, twenty centimeters. And at the same time, uh, it's long enough that micron particulate or smoke doesn't block the beam it goes through it you know you know most modern cars now have adaptive uh boost control and collision warning radars they use a millimeter wave radar under the hood it's in the 70 to 80 gigahertz range and uh it can see through some fog and uh uh at night and whatever and uh it works very well. So they're uh, very popular. Uh, I remember in the 90s when they were developing it over here uh, in, in a company in, uh, in Massachusetts. Okay, and uh, 
Also, 5G telephones are going up to 28 gigahertz, which is falling in that range now, too. So it could be possible if they start drilling a lot of these wells, there will be some issues about interference. <laughs> From the drill. Yeah, but whatever, those issues I'm not going to worry about right now. We'll drill lots of telephones. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. yeah. And effect, yeah. So anyhow, it operates at high temperature. The thermodynamics is going to work for us to replace the drilling one of the cable drill. I'll describe that. And the technology is available. You can go out and buy a one or two megawatt charitron. The waveguides are around, and also remote di diagnostics are available to monitor key parameters of the operation. So I'm going to describe the science basis now and the energy requirements, the potential rates of penetration, and stable stabilization of the casing. So this is a, a, a relatively complicated View graph, but I wanted to show that we do know what it takes, what energy it takes to vaporize rock. That equation on top, the heat of enthalpy uh, to vaporize rock, I'll go through terms quickly. The C sub S is the heat capacity of a solid, and it, we need to raise the temperature from an initial temperature to the melt temperature. Then you have the heat of fusion, the energy needed to convert the solid phase into a liquid. Then you next have to heat that liquid to melt uh, by the temperature you need to go from the melt point to the vaporization. And then finally, you need to uh, provide the, uh, the heat of vaporization, the heat needed to convert from a melt to a vapor. That's simplified, uh, uh, but it was first put down by Maurer in 1968, shortly after laser burn invented, because they were already thinking about using direct and energy to drill holes back then. And if you look into the numbers, we know most of the numbers fairly well. Uh, on average, that's an average number. These heat capacities change with temperature, they're increasing. But if you take an average number, simplify this, you can calculate that it takes about four to five kilojoules per cubic centimeter to melt granite or salt. And then when you have that melt, you can, if you know the vaporization temperature, uh, a little over 3,000 degrees centigrade, uh, then it takes about five uh, kilojoules per cubic centimeter just for the heat of vaporization. That's a lot of energy compared to melting. It takes a lot of energy to vaporize rock. But finally, you run, up, run into numbers on the order of 25 to 28 kilojoules per cubic centimeter to vaporize granite basalt. And getting back to my Tesla Model 3, the 74 kilowatt battery of that automobile could vaporize a 10 centimeter cube of granite or basalt. Okay. That's if it's all absorbed efficiently. Okay. I do that example because a lot of people don't have an idea what the kilojoule is or whatever. Great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, knowing how much energy it takes, we can then calculate the electricity costs to vaporize rock. And uh, first, I, ha I have to put in some uh, efficiencies because the gyrotron has about 50% efficiency, the transmission line about 90%. And from the measurements I've made in the lab, uh, the melt will absorb about 70% of energy into the auto. The rest is reflected. Uh, so uh, here I'm plotting the cost. It goes from a dollar per meter to $100 per meter. This is a log scale. And the borehole diameter from about two centimeters to 50 centimeter, this is also a log scale. So the lines look straight because you know the uh, area goes as a square and uh, the energy goes up uh, quite quickly uh, with diameter. And I plot two curves. One, the energy needed or uh, the cost to uh, melt from a solid to a melt. And then the second one is the cost to completely vaporize it. So if I take a diameter at 20 centimeters, about eight inches, that's a typical borehole size. Uh, you can uh, uh, calculate what it would cost per meter to vaporize that size hole, assuming 12 cents per kilowatt hour. This is a low number. It doesn't include all the transmission costs and whatever. This is just a number. Uh, uh, there are actually some states in the West that claim they produce energy at that price. Uh, not in Massachusetts, though. <laughs> uh, so uh, 
$14 to $85 per meter. $14 would be just to melt it and displace it into a wall. $85 would be if we completely vaporize it all and blow it out and smoke. Probably some number in the middle would uh, uh, be the practical one because we want to displace some of that glass to make a case. Uh, so I assume the number of 20 kilojoules per cubic centimeter to vaporize, that's plus or minus a little bit. So uh, uh, when I did it for an eight kil kilometer deep wall hole because I wanted to compare to mechanical driller. So I drilling holes, so I cut back in depth where eight kilometer deep holes are are done in the mechanical drilling industry. Uh, the electricity to drill that deep will be anywhere from 100,000 to 700,000 just for the electricity. Okay, so that's the main consumable drilling. I don't know exactly how that's made other costs like uh, labor and uh, whatever the logistics and uh, needed and hardware. This is just the main consumable cost. I assume the other costs could be armorized. You know, the Jarotrons are $10 million, so that would have to be armorized over many holes. But, uh, but if you try to look up the cost of drilling a hole that deep, and that information is difficult to find because most of the companies hold that <laughs> information close to them. But there were reports in Oklahoma, and it was a report in 2006, uh, something $50 million to drill a hole that deep. They are expensive. But you notice the main consumable with directed energy drilling is something like a hundred times less. So it can't be that expensive uh, when we put all the other stuff compared to current mechanical drilling holes. And they really can't get over 10 kilometers uh, very well anyway. Uh, so that, again, to my Tesla Model 3 charges, to drill an eight kilometer hole that's eight inches in diameter, would take uh, 4,000 uh, cars uh, just to melt and 25,000 to melt it. But you can drive up 25,000 cars and <laughs> discharge them and drill your eight kilometer hole. <laughs> 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 yeah, they'd be happy. Okay. He, Elon, he wants to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, let's let's go down. Well, the other thing is uh, uh, the drill rate is proportional to beam intensity. Okay, and here I'm plotting the rate of penetration from zero to 100 meter per hour. And this is the size of the hole from uh, zero to 100 uh, centimeters. Uh, eight inches is the eight inch diameter hole that I'm using. And so uh, if you want to just, if you could just melt the hole through, that's the blue curve. And if you want to vaporize it, that's the uh, red curve. Uh, so you need, if you can put 20 kilowatts per square centimeter, which is this number, uh, you could drill a hole at 19 meters per hour to vaporize it or 40 meters per hour to just melt it if you displace all of the, the melt. Uh, so uh, there is a, a limit here, air breakdown. If you try to put a lot of kilowatts per square centimeter, you create a plasma and breaks down like a lightning bolt. So this, this is going to limit an atmospheric pressure, how much power you can bring to bear. And, uh, and the one reference I, I saw about 20 kilowatts per square centimeter would be an upper limit, but this will be the limit how far we could go, go on that uh, axis of atmospheric pressure. But breakdown depends on pressure. You know, beams are transmitted at far higher intensity and high vacuum, and the breakdown limit is very high at high pressure as well. Uh, so, uh, but in the atmospheric pressure range, this is about the limit. Uh, so with that kind of power density, you could drill at 90 meter per hour, 10 kilometer deep hole in 22 days, if it's on 24.7. Now, if you look up, the deepest hole is uh, done in the US, nine and a half kilometer deep, the big Bertha Rogers hole in Oklahoma, done in the 70s. That took 18 months to do, you know, because the drill rate drops when they can't drill with depth, so no longer can penetrate. 
whereas a directed energy beam could be maintained as long as you can maintain the power on target and could drill that uh, uh, hole in a phenomenally short time. This is to be demonstrated. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to uh, point out is the thermodynamics of high temperature drilling. Now we deal with very high pressures underground. This uh, vertical plot is from surface to 20 kilometer depth. And this uh, axis is the pressure, subsurface pressure uh, from uh, surface to uh, over 5,000 atmospheres. These are extremely high pressures. And the red curve is the lysostatic pressure, the weight of a column of rock. That's generally the highest pressure you'll see underground. And then the uh, blue line is the hydrostatic pressure, the weight of a column of water, which generally is what you see in a practical uh, drilling application. Uh, the, the actual drill rates are nearer to hydrostatic pressure than the lysostatic pressure. But I put another uh, 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 plot on this graph, and that's the barometric pressure of a gas. That's an incompressible uh, medium. And uh, this uh, violet curve shows how the pressure will increase with a fill of uh, argon gas I'm using in this case, greater than air. Uh, and uh, if you start out at initial pressure of 150 atmosphere with some pump, you can equal the hydrostatic pressure of 40 kilometers, 1300 atmospheres there. Uh, but we're in a confined volume in a hole. And the uh, gas law uh, tells us that uh, in the confined volume, uh, pressure is proportional to temperature. Okay. The real gas law, even the, uh, uh, the ideal gas law and the real gas law, which has a term uh, in it for um, density, it turns out as the temperature goes up, that Z term is close to one. So the scaling goes up. If we bring the beam down and it's absorbed here and raises the temperature from 300 Kelvin to 3000, then the pressure in the volume will increase tremendously. It could increase above local lithostatic pressure. And this is the mechanism that I suggest will uh, for our casing, uh, because the fluid will be forced out into the walls under pressure uh, before it vaporizes. And to vaporize it, you have to raise the fluid from, say, 1200 degrees C to 3000, but the viscosity of the fluid goes down with temperature. Why and so, would it, why would it blow your? Uh, drill your waveguide right out of the hole. Well, the pressure doesn't occur, occur in the waveguide. It occurs oh, at the target right. region. Right. And the waveguide is being purged by uh, gas that starts out at room temperature. So it's being purged. So it's bringing down a cold gas. The place where the uh, pressure occurs is right at the localized volume where the rock is being melted. Oh, they're up. Yeah. It, the oh, yeah. It will, uh, it will affect the the pressure up here a little along this curve, but displaced. But uh, uh, it, it should hold together. But that is another engineering point uh, to look at. But it's but the the thing is the, the pressure is demonstrated locally at depth, not at the surface. But it will transmit partially up to the surface. By the way, you have a tremendous pressure drop going back up in the exhaust. You're in a narrow pipe and you're going kilometers up. The pressure on the exhaust is going to be uh, maybe veiled off by the pressure drop of the flow in a confined volume. Uh, anyhow, you could calculate what's the maximum wall thickness you can uh, obtain uh, if you displace all material in the walls. So we could make a wall that's five, uh, uh, one, fifth. Uh, the, the diameter size, when you get to that size of a wall, which is the Young's modulus of the material of which it's weighed, the Young's modulus of this all glass 
is 85 gigapascal, so 800,000 atmospheres. We could make in principle if I find this approach. Uh, uh, so, but that again also needs to be tested. We have a professor at MIT who's uh, looking at this for us. So, you know, I just wanted to cover is the technology. Let's see. I'm showing here, I'm waiting for it up here. <laughs> the technology that uh, uh, we need and that it is available. Okay, the high power gyrotrons, millimeter transmission lines, remote diagnostics, these are all spin offs from the Fusion Energy Research Program. So, this, uh, I'm going to show you a gyrotrons in the next few years. Megawatt gyrotrons. Basically, a gyrotron converts a high voltage electron beam. Uh, into a millimeter beam by sending that beam through a resonance cavity in a magnet. And the um, interaction is, is through the electron synchrotron resonance. So at five Tesla, that's the resonance of an electron at 140 gigahertz. And uh, you can then con convert 50% or more of that electron beam energy to the millimeter beam. And then the output. Uh, beam is deflected by the waveguide and the series of mirrors to uh, transform it into a Gaussian beam, and a spin beam is collected in a uh, collector up here. That's really massive compared to the Gertrude tube down here, which is tiny. Because uh, if you're generating a megawatt, uh, there is a megawatt uh, arriving here, so there's a lot of engineering has got into the heat transfer reservoir. Uh, so that's that's a tube built by the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency for, the, for their fusion research program. And then we have another one here. That's just a tube, but it has to sit in a superconducting magnet, which is here. You can see the frost on the uh, cryogenic uh, uh, chamber here. The diamond window is here. And then this is the heat exchange. It has to be massive to accept that megawatt of energy. This is a uh, uh, Charitron installed at the double three D experiment in San Diego in General Atomics. Uh, so these tubes are available, and there are many of them uh, in many fusion experiments. Uh, the next technology is transmission efficiency, uh, and we have the waveguide technology. Uh, basically, it's a corrugated waveguide. General Atomic makes a commercial product there. Uh, these were uh, uh, invented in the 1950s by Bell Laboratories when, before lasers, and they were thinking about increasing the communications uh, capacity between, range, uh, between regions. They had to go to higher frequency and how to transmit efficiently. They came up with the corrugated waveguide. It uh, uh, propagates. Uh, an efficient Gaussian-like beam. And if the corrugations are the right dimensions, quarter wavelength feet and three or more per length, uh, and the diameter is overmoded enough, that is, it's many wavelengths, the electric field goes near to zero on the wall. And that's why they're efficient. There's very little field at the edges. And so these waves can the uh, power and actually quite high power for transmission efficiency for straight length. And this is distance in kilometers, up to 20 kilometers. If you do the, uh, the uh, calculation on paper, it's on paper. <laughs> uh, the copper waveguide of uh, five inches diameter can transmit uh, the energy with 90% of efficiency to 20, 20 kilometers. If you use a more practical, but still pretty good, it could transmit 70% to 20 kilometers. And also, if you look at a dielectric waveguide, like a glass fiber or a granite hole, you could calculate this transmission efficiency. And you could go 70% efficient to 100 meters. 
uh, sideways and drill a hole, horizontal hole to another hole that's underneath. Uh, so uh, they're very fit. Now these are boundary losses. We have to, this is a hollow guide with nothing in it except dry air or, or a dipole and a nitrogen, hydrogen, or even a methane molecule has no dipole moment and transmit this uh, bar. However, if you go to high pressure, you have intermolecular collisions that induce a dipole moment. So the absorption of uh, these molecules increases at high pressure. That's another engineering uh, I think they'll have to be looked at on how to work at high pressures with these waveguides. So, and also uh, the next thing is diagnostics, remote diagnostics, because how do you monitor 3,000 degree operation? Right now, the mechanical drilling have, have serious challenge in monitoring the 300 degree operation because they, they like to put electronics and sensors down in the hole. But in the fusion program, we never can bring anything in contact. We do everything remotely. So we have... Uh, radiometers uh, at uh, the middle range. I work on this one three seven gigahertz radiometer that can be multiple, and it's in a reflectometer that could give us position measurement at a distance. And here's some sample data I have from the lab on the right to show that this is done. Uh, we were heating a granite. Uh, uh, Example: We're making a, uh, a a crater in granite, and so you can see the temperature in real time as we're heating it. The temperature scale goes from zero to twenty five hundred degrees centigrade, and the time is seconds. Uh, so you, it, it starts out the solid is heated up, and then suddenly there's a jump when it melts, and uh, you see that melt slowly drifting upward. But if the temperature is uh, around twenty five. 2,500 degrees centigrade in the center here. Uh, and uh, that's not corrected for the emissivity either, so it's probably larger than that. Uh, there's also a, a detector behind the rock uh, looking at transmission through the rock. These one-inch thick samples do transmit some of the beam through, but of course, when it melts, it goes suddenly opaque. You see transmission drops and the temperature jumps. Uh, tremendously. Then the other one, I showed granite because it didn't make a hole. You can see the melt getting really, really hot, and we didn't get the vaporization. However, if you make a hole like in basalt here, uh, the temperature doesn't go up that high because the melt just pours out before it gets hot. Uh, the viscosity of basalt is a lot uh, lower than the viscosity granite because of the silica content. Uh, but we could measure displacement also remotely because this 94 gigahertz reflectometer is monitoring the signal reflected by a beam incident. And when the reflection and incident coherently interfere in the uh, reflectometer, you get fringes. And you see them here one, two, three. Every half wavelength change in um, the distance or quarter wavelength change in displacement because it's around tripping leads to change from maximum to minimum. And you can see that at 94 gigahertz, we have six fringes there. That corresponds to about a centimeter depth. Uh, but at the same time, the heating beam itself is a coherent beam. The gyrotrons have a very narrow line width and are coherent. We were monitoring the reflection from the gyrotron and you see one, two, three fringes roughly compared to six. And that's in the right proportion between the wavelengths to indicate a one centimeter displacement. And this occurred over about two minutes. So actually all of the action, even though we're heating the rock for up to 20 minutes, all of the displacement action occurred in about two minutes. Uh, but it was uh, driven by the airflow, not by actual vaporization. So that's not a true way to compare the actual Penetration rates I'm calculating, but it does show that we can monitor in real time rate of penetration, position, temperature. We could also monitor composition, uh, but I'm not going to get into that uh, part of it. All remotely.
at 2,000 to 3,000 degrees centigrade. Uh, and I was just going to show some laboratory experiments. Uh, at 28 gigahertz, we've done uh, experiments with 10, 20 kilowatt gyrotron, but we only could get up to five kilowatt on target because of losses in the transmission line and motor converters that I had to install. Uh, but we did achieve uh, five centimeter diameter holes, two inch diameter holes in the first rock. This, by the way, five kilowatts is, you know, uh, compared to megawatt available. We did, we did this with like maybe, what, 2% of the power available commercially. <laughs> so you can imagine this could expand definitely the damage and the previous uh, And then we had a plan to go to Oak Ridge National Laboratory to use an old uh, 200 kilowatt gyrotron. That wasn't too successful, but I'll show that also. These though, were funded, uh, let's see, I work with Ken Oglesby at Impact Technologies from Oklahoma on the uh, work at MIT and also uh, at Oak Ridge. And then Quays Energy was a company that was started up uh, to try to commercialize this. And they had ARPA e support uh, for the Oak Ridge work. So uh, uh, let's see. First, I'll show the MIT uh, laboratory setup. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, on the right there is the cabinet that we bought from CPI from San Jose, California. It's a, a package uh, with the gyrotron, the power supply, the electronics to control it, whatever. Uh, the gyrotron itself is that small drum in the lower right of the cabinet. It's a 10 kilowatt 20 gyrotron, and it's not a superconducting magnet because it operates on the first harmonic of 28. So that's the half Tesla magnet that's actually a copper solenoid. And uh, the vertical, the beam comes out vertically, and there are a number of waveguide components that uh, process the beam. We, monitor forward and backward power, motor converters, the beam goes straight up. Then there's a transmission line with more con converters to convert to a Gaussian beam. These uh, resonators work on high order microwave loads. You can't use them practically, uh, but you like to use a Gaussian beam from a laser. So there have to be components to motor convert to get to get kind of beam. So uh, we made up some of that and then uh, we came down uh, for, with a minor bed. You can see it in the upper left corner there. The diagnostics are plugged in through the pinhole on top. You can always bring in a diagnostic at two millimeters into a wave by transmitting a 10 millimeter wave heating beam by using a hole that's cut off the heating beam. So you can multiplex very easily diagnostics on a high power beam. I'm operating at five kilowatts here. I'm monitoring nanowatts of thermal emission at the same time. Uh, so we come down, we have tapers that bring it down into a test chamber where we put our rocks. It's all enclosed in a steel chamber, so there was no leakage. Because as you know, there's 70% reflected by the rock. You can't have radiation uh, into the lab. I'm standing next to that control panel that's a few feet from there. So that wouldn't be allowed. We we had our health and safety office with uh, 20 gigahertz sniffers monitoring for radiation. So it has to be safe. So everything has to be buttoned up fairly tightly. And we are in this setup. And uh, and we were able to demonstrate everything on a small scale for drilling operation, all the necessary elements, reflected power. As I mentioned, 70% could be reflected back. And it was necessary to isolate that from the tube. The tube doesn't like reflected power. So that's a component not needed in fusion or GPD because uh, uh, the plasma is completely absorbing. But in heating the material that's aligned with the beam, you need to have something in there. And I put in something that was uh, work with polarization. We were able to circularly polarize the beam beam by a miter bend. So the linear polarization was circularly polarization to flip to the orthogonal polarization. 
And then there's a, a, a polarizing grid that deflects the reflective power out to a beam dump on the side. Uh, we weren't able to heat the rock very well until that was implemented. So we demonstrated the reflective power on isolator. Uh, we also were able to put in a purge gas because you can have small holes to bring in purge gas to make uh, collinear. That's what brought up this uh, these crater walls. You know, this we couldn't vaporize it, but the force of the air was bringing out the material. Uh, the crater, the leak hole was uh, plugged up because the vis viscosity was. Uh, we demonstrate collinear diagnostics. The borehole propagation and vitrified walls was shown, and I'll show you that on the next uh, view graph. And we did actually observe the, the pressure rise. We had a pressure gauge up in the waveguide, and I had a design where I confined the waveguide into the sample truck target in a tiny chamber where I made a 50,000 inch annular leak rate for the gas. So to create that pressure drop for the exhaust. And sure enough, when we heated it, we did absorb the pressure rise, as you say, and we did see it in the waveguide. Okay, so the thermodynamics was working as I was describing, heating in a confined volume like a borehole with an annular uh, exhaust uh, caused a big trip, pressure drop that confines the volume and temperature leads to pressure rise. And that ultimately, I hope, drive the melt into the wall to make the case. Uh, so all of the main uh, elements were shown. And let me show you the uh, one of the targets. It's Need some music. It's 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 working. I mean, I got on the outside. You see it. You see, you see on the outside. Okay, I I see the picture on my computer. Waiting yeah. for the video. The people at home are seeing it. The people at home are seeing it. Okay, here we go. Okay, this shows the leverage borehole. This is a photograph of a basalt target. This is the end of the waveguide, just above the target. It's about twenty-five millimeters, one inch separation because the, the launch diameter was tapered down here to about two wavelengths, 20 millimeters. So uh, that to concentrate the beam, but the beam is diverging like a flashlight when they go out, it's almost like 50 degree divergent. So the beam expanded to this size by the time the beam propagated out of the waveguide. That's how we drill a hole bigger than the waveguide. The diffraction causes the beam to get bigger quickly. Uh, uh, now, uh, we started with small wheat leak hole to allow the, the melt to uh, pour out. Uh, this basalt rock is 10 centimeters, four inches on a side. You notice that uh, all of these thermal fractures, because we're heating it to 2,500 degrees C here, but here the temperature is only room temperature, 20 C. So we have a tremendous heat gradient and that fractures the rock. You notice the rock is banded with a steel band to hold it together because before we did that, these samples were blowing apart, you know, in the in the chamber because the heat stresses are really tremendous. Uh, it's a good thing we had that steel chamber confining everything, the millimeter ways it confined all the debris in the first test. But then when we started banding and we could hold them together long enough to generate these holes, and I I've left it intact with the banding here because uh, if I take them apart, it could break apart. But also uh, you could see a cross section of the hole. You know, you know, I told you that the beam is diverging at 50 degrees angle when it's launched because it, it went from 20 millimeters to 50 millimeter diameter. But notice the hole for 38 millimeter lengths is collinear. So the glass wall is acting like a fiber optic for the waste. It is guiding the beam as you go through. So there's the principle of drilling a hole um, uh, through the rock of a given size. And you notice we also have a vitrified wall. There's no pressure behind this uh, wall, but there is a four millimeter melt. And, and you can see it in here, if you look around in this uh, hole, you know, you can see it, it's, it's all vitrified. It's not very smooth, but at 10 millimeter wavelengths, it doesn't have to be smooth. You know, you can see visible imperfections, but it's still be a good wave going. 
Uh, so we've uh, shown shown that so in the lab. Question. So that says that the I'm, I'm just picturing this thing in the large um, when you're going down, uh, say, ten kilometers. Yeah. Um, there's there's it stays constant width. No, it won't. If you if you look at laser drilling holes in the lab and they, they would launch a laser on a, a material plexiglass or whatever, you'll see the hole pencil because as you go down, there's uh, losses in the wall. The, the dielectric waveguide isn't as efficient as a coordinated metal wall. So the beam will be gradually getting weaker and the hole would pencil. So the, the concept here is we would track the waveguide as we drill it. And okay, there's a lot of interesting engineering issues of how you do that and keep straight. But there's another possibility. We could start with a gyrotron twice as powerful as we need, launch it, and start at half a kilowatt. And as it propagates and we're monitoring the distance, we increase it to maintain the power density at the, the beam. So it's possible maybe we could drill a hole for 100 uh, meters, then stop and advance it to 100 meters by controlling the power. So you do need to control the power to keep the diameter the same. Uh, this is an engineering issue that will have to be addressed also how to do that. But it's not like a mechanical drill where you have to drill that to find the hole. Here we have to uh, uh, control the power incident, the rate of penetration, uh, and uh, other things uh, to have a hole, uh, a constant hole diameter. Uh, of course, of course if, if all the um, melted material turns into this vitrified wall, yeah. is that sufficiently more dense than the original rock that you actually can create a, a bunch of space? Uh, space? How does it flow into the space? I mean, there, how could you displace it if there's what no would space? Be 100%. Yeah, say, where does this? Where does, the rock, the thing, yeah. where does the rock go? It goes into the microfractures of the rock. The rock, uh, actually, you saw it thermally fractured quite a bit. So it will flow back under intense pressure. Uh, and hopefully, there'll be enough space in microfractures that will force it in there. Uh, Some of it is vaporized, and that and that'll that'll be returned to the atmosphere. Correct. Uh, an important one is to capture all of the nanoparticles. That is a hazardous material. But the, you know, in the Energy Initiative uh, first report on that back, I don't know, ten years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, Robert Armstrong said we got to put something about what we're going to do with the nanoparticles. So, uh, you know, they have bag houses for uh, capture air pollution and dirty exhaust and industry. Uh, ultimately, in the lab, I had to do it in the lab, too, to satisfy the uh, environmental office at MIT. So what we do is we have a high efficiency, you know, a HEPA filter, a commercial one, which is good to about two and a half micron particles. And then we take the exhaust of HEPA filter and we go through a water bath. So then it goes into a tank with water is bubbled through and then it comes out for exhaust. So uh, the water, so in the in the first report, it said we would uh, collect the exhaust and uh, pump it through a pool to, to clean it before it exhausts in the atmosphere. Well, um, the pool. <laughs> yeah, well, in the pool. actually, there was a suggestion that nanoparticle silica is a commercial commodity in the products industry. To grow circuits, so wow. circuits, and there's a market for it. Right? So there was a suggestion since most of the particulate we uh, extract will be silica to collect it. Okay. So but I don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so we went to Oak Ridge uh, a year and a half ago, and unfortunately, our goal was not achieved. This is the 200 uh, kilowatt gyrotron at Oak Ridge. Uh, it was an old gyrotron from the 1980s, one of the first ones. It didn't have a very good mode in it, and it still doesn't. Uh, there is a melt uh, melt crater that we got initially. You know, it's not a nice round crater. 
that I have here. That that diameter of rock there is 150 millimeters, and we're trying to do a three inch hole. But the beam came out like a wonderful. Huh. And it's full of little, the hot spots also cause problems with arcing in the waveguide and breakdown that limited us. And in fact, in the end, we couldn't transmit more than 30 kilowatts uh, to the target uh, in a long pulse. So actually, after trying, we uh, have are abandoning this experiment at Oak Ridge and shifting to Quay's Energy in Houston. We're setting up a dedicated facility uh, with their own design, uh, waveguide components. Uh, they're setting up a 25 to 75 kilowatt, 28 gigahertz. Uh, they have received, uh, they have on site 100 kilowatt, 95 gigahertz, for, they tend to use for field use. And they have a one megawatt, 105 gigahertz Chartron on order. Uh, so uh, so we, we have a little hiccup at Oak Ridge, but I think we will resolve the uh, engineering issues at Quays. And also, uh, China's pursuing this. They, they visited me, and uh, they're very interested. They actually, they offered me a job to come head their lab, but I, I think respectfully declined. But uh, China Shengdu has achieved uh, uh, melts similar to what I have achieved in the lab with a 20 kilowatt, 75 gigahertz line. So there, there is interest uh, in a lot of places to pursue this. So, uh, uh, so commercialization, Quays Energy Incorporated more, uh, has been formed to commercialize milling wave using gyrotrons. They were a spinoff of Alter Rock Energy in Seattle, Washington, which initially licensed the technology, but then realized they wanted to separate this development from their, from their main effort to uh, build geothermal plants with conventional technology. So Quays is now working, and they're fairly well funded now. A lot of private funding was attracted, particularly people that missed out in Commonwealth Fusion, it's one of the fusion programs. Well, they were looking for something else. So Quays actually uh, is well funded, and uh, they're building up, and uh, uh, hopefully they'll be making good progress. They're making good progress. The primary goal is to build super hot rock geothermal systems for electric power generation. And also, uh, there's a, a goal to exploit abandoned coal fire plants and just build the wells at those sites and bring those back online using geothermal power. Alter Rock got the uh, rights to, um, I don't know, a half a dozen some power plants in the US. And so they're looking to quickly bring this online to develop the gyrotron drilling part to go deep, exploit supercritical heat from deep under the plant. And then bring the uh, coal plants back online as geothermal plants. So our plants already have built, so or more than half built. So we just have to connect the, the last dot here. So uh, that ends my talk. So uh, the key point here is the science is optimum, which I hope I've shown here. Uh, uh, the technology is com largely commercially available. Uh, the feasibility we have established in the lab and a commercial is on track now and hopefully will be results soon. So, would an earthquake interfere with this in any way? Yeah, I, I think it would. Yeah. Uh, but, so, we're yeah. tracking. Huh? If, yeah. You have to be careful where you do. But it's actually the heat reservoir formation that causes earthquakes associated with geothermal plants. Like in Oklahoma. Just a plain old ordinary earthquake. Oh, a plain ordinary, not triggered by the plant yeah. itself. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it would, you know, probably break the glass wall of the tube. So, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, an earthquake would be trouble. Yeah. So, so let's ask the silly question. So you do have an earthquake and the glass wall is broken. Yeah. Can you just, quote unquote, re-drill it to, to replace the glass wall? Yeah, I would assume you could bring the gyrotron back and uh, yeah. re and rebelt. Yeah. So like dentists would be at all. Yeah. Re-drill yeah. everything. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I thought that was just a money laundering thing. Okay. I first started reading about this stuff. I said to myself, this looks as good as food. Does the rest of your lab think that this is on par with vision? No, the, the director, Dennis White, is fully behind this. Uh, uh, he was very successful in helping Carmel Fusion to start. And uh, he saw this as a, a clean energy, and uh, he's very supportive of, uh, of pursuing this. Yeah, using our unique uh, background and high power uh, microwave sources. So it's going to be a race to see who's uh, who's available first, fusion or this thing. Well, this would seem when once you get going to be cheaper. Oh yeah, I I think this could be online first yeah. actually because we have fewer problems to solve the, 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 the put up a the number of problems are fewer, but the solving them could be a little trickier. Well, but yeah, the, the, the Commonwealth fusion stuff requires miles and miles of superconductors. Yeah, which but, makes each plant rather expensive. Once yeah. you get going with this, you keep using the wave. Yeah. And... Well, I mean, we have some inter engineering issues too. The the breakdown issue has to be uh, tackled, and then transmission efficiently in a high pressure environment. What about pollution? Pollution. Well, I, I'm you're, hoping you're running that water down through the zone. Yeah, the water will go down. Uh, you said the uh, company. Actually, there will be less pollution than conventional. Uh, uh, geo, EGS geothermal plants, which go through a fractured uh, reservoir, they need to uh, absorb heat, and at high temperatures, there's some dissolution of the uh, components in that heat transfer reservoir, so their water coming up is not clean. But if we were to engineer this right and uh, take advantage of glass wall lines, it would be clean air. You know, you need clean steam for uh, for uh, or turbine generators. So I would think, uh, you know, the glass melts at 1200 degrees centigrade. So we could easily bring up 400 degrees C water, but the uh, uh, rock formation elements, there are components in there that would dissolve at 400 degrees C. So they're not it's See, clean. That's what I asked. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. Is or, in so, California, which so, is so, conventional so, geothermal, you visit has. And nearby town wastewater has been possible by pumping it into the ground because it's the water. Yeah. To be fair, let's see what let's see what's going on there. I see that Ken has his hand up. I just want to check the uh, chat before we get uh, before we get too far afield here. Come on, boys and girls. Let's see what we got here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, and, uh, uh, Ed says you still need to all the deep get out of the now that there's my okay. Uh, journal going on. We guys, I guess that's it. All right. Uh, uh questions here, Chris. Yeah, we have a question here. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, I'd like to drill down if I may into the vitreous material that you're using for the casing. Is that silica? That makes that that becomes vitreous when you get when basalt and granite is heated. Yeah, it's, it's a, that forms that vitreous. It's a, it's a, a black glass that has the composition of the basalt material it started with. It has the metal oxides of the minerals and the basalt dissolved in the black glass, so it it will be. The salt is 50% silica. So what makes it glassy? Glassy. Uh, well, it's a, uh, a homogeneous fluid. It's not made up of minerals. It's a homogeneous fluid of, uh, of metal oxides. No. And the metal oxides are the metal oxides present in, in the salt. Okay, that goes to my final question, I think. Have you looked at the, at the um, material science aspect of these? As it being formed, in other words, have you done have you done analysis of what's being formed at these uh, vitreous areas? Uh, uh, we haven't done it with depth. So I'm I'm concerned that when you go to various depths, it's going to change. Uh, so that, that yeah, I'm, I'm, it's probably it's possible it will it will change. Uh, probable it will change to the detailed chemistry. Haven't done detailed analysis on this particular glass. 
but there is a lot of research being done of vitrified glass uh, waste, vitrified waste, nuclear waste yeah. storage at Pacific Northwest right. Laboratory. And so they have similar type metal oxide mix mixtures that they work in. They look at the, the, uh, the chemistry and the properties of the glass to form. And I'm sure some of that could be brought to bear eventually. This, the, the main studies we're interested in right now are the physical strength properties. We, we, we have a uh, uh, partnership with the Rock Mechanics Lab uh, at MIT. Yeah, that's the reason I asked the question because there's a chemistry changes and mechanical problems will change also. Yes, they probably will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can stop I think the big the big issue is, as I put in my chat, uh, you're still drilling a hole with a drilling rig. You're not avoiding any of that. And I think the estimate of the time to do the drilling is uh, really uh, excessively optimistic because uh, you still have to be handling drill pipe, or in this case, it's waveguide. It might even be a little more challenging. And, and you've got kilometers of this stuff that you're putting down the hole. And, and uh, that's, a, you know, that's a big mechanical hoisting and, and lowering process that goes on whenever you have to add another section of waveguide, unless you can unroll the waveguide from a, from a reel or something like that. Uh, you, you're gonna be uh, doing the things that they do when they drill holes in the ground uh, for rock, hard rock drilling, looking for, uh, you know, uh, platinum or or gold or something, or or where they're drilling for petro uh, materials. How do you how do you get around that issue? Just a second. Hello, you good, Paul? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can hear you. I see me on that. Okay. Uh, so 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 Ted was asking uh, the the uh, similar. He wants to know about how you get around the similar problem of current drilling, if I understand it right, Ted, they use sections of, of physical pipe and they bolt them together or do whatever they do together to uh, to, yeah. block, to line the borehole. Right. You have a similar issue with the waveguides, yeah. I, I would suspect. Oh yeah, it would be even a more difficult issue because we have to keep it perfectly straight. Um, yeah, so 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 my question was basically- The, uh, the corrugation it, 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 Unless yeah. you can unroll well, the, the drill pipe. <laughs> But you know this stuff, uh, five, six, seven kilometers of waveguide, that's uh, going to be a challenge. You're going to have you know big, huge derrick that has to be able to handle long sections because you don't want to oh, yeah. have to pull it up and and connect sections very commonly. Uh, you know you don't want a short little derrick. It's a big, huge derrick similar to what they do when they drill uh, deep holes in the in the bottom of the ocean. You know, you need essentially what you need is the uh, the Glomar <laughs> Explorer from Mr. Hughes there uh, that can handle you know hundreds of tons of pipe, and uh, there's going to be you know there's going to be a lot of lifting and 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 uh, attaching, and of course in the case of uh, drill pipe, you know it's it's a lot more mechanically uh, reliable material than than fine precision waveguide. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I agree. The engineering of uh, the waveguide sections and connecting them would be a, a challenge, uh, and that has to be worked out. That's why I was suggesting controlling power rather than uh, trying to track in detail the uh, advancement of the beam to fix it at one point, drill, then reset up at the deeper level and, and go uh, in steps. Uh, because the, the, the engineering of aligning the waveguide is going to be much, much more challenging than currently just connecting drill pipe. Can the waveguide be made out of a flexible material as opposed to a rigid material? Yeah, it could, uh, but it should uh, be fairly straight or the flexes should be uh, uh, engineered so they don't uh, uh, deteriorate the beam quality. Yeah. I mean, they're in general atomic, they're looking at, you know, one of the applications is going into existing boreholes that have been drilled mechanically and then go over to uh, chapter on beam drilling at a depth with mechanical drilling 
uh, can advance. And mechanical drills don't really drill straight balls. And a lot of them are corkscrewed. Yeah. And uh, there, there's a lot of uh, theory behind waveguide mode conversion propagation. Uh, general atomic labs is look, have been looking at some of that. Uh, so there are there are challenges there. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Alexander. Yeah, um, you're going to be vaporizing a lot of material. Um, how are you going to maintain the integrity of the waveguide when some of that vapor is going to go back up into the waveguide? Uh, no, we're we're looking at not uh, not allowing the uh, vapor to go up the waveguide. We we will be superimposing a strong um, gas purge collinear with the beam which at the aperture of the waveguide would be sufficient to overcome any pressure uh, coming back from the uh, hole that's being ablated. The, the annual new region around the waveguide will be open to uh, the atmosphere on top. So that should be at a slightly lower pressure than the aperture of the waveguide. So, don't, so we're not really anticipating uh, any significant backflow up the waveguide. There may be a little diffusion because I do see that in the lab in the first six inches of the waveguide, but we're not going to flow uh, intentionally any exhaust up the waveguide. It's going to be down. Well, this is a related question, um, which you may have touched on, but um, you have a lot of material you have to get rid of. Where is it going? Well, uh, it's going to go up in the annual region and be exhausted into a bag house and then clean uh, in a collection pond. Uh, but hopefully, we will use a large fraction of it to make the case. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm more concerned about is, um, is you know, you're creating all you're creating this waste. It's it's vapor. It's, yeah. it's going to deposit somewhere. Um, and uh, is it going to just be sticking in your waveguide? Or, well, or, we're not, we're or it's not in your waveguide? Or, uh, you know, well, we're not it's on the outside? Or what? We're not or, planning to exhaust through the waveguide. We're planning to exhaust through the annual region. And, you know, we have been uh, uh, concerned about sticking, but that will have to be looked at more. But we're going to have enough of a velocity flow uh, in the annual region to keep pushing it up. I mean, will you have to heat it to make sure it doesn't condense? No, we, we're not going to heat it uh, uh, anymore after it's ablated. And, uh, actually, in the, we're in the, in the other, uh, other side yeah. to keep it cool. We don't want to uh, heat the waveguide any more than we need to. And uh, so we don't plan to heat the exhaust. Question, John. Then uh, yeah, we'll carry the emails back here. There were there were a lot of times when you said, "Well, that's an engineering problem," and yes. it, it reminds me of uh, when Kennedy said, "We'll get to the moon in ten years. We understand the science. We just have a little bit of engineering to work out." <laughs> and uh, what I'm wondering really is. How hard is the engineering and how far beyond current best practices do you have to go? Well, it's hard to be really precise on that, but uh, uh, I think the engineering is going to be more difficult than the engineer needed to land the man on the moon. <laughs> uh, yes, but that had a lot of money behind it. Yeah, it did. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the two issues I see, at least for the side of it, is breakdown and uh, efficient transmission and high pressure of the beam. The other more engineering issues of mechanically uh, installing the waveguide and keeping it straight, uh, that's a more mechanical engineering issue. I would think we have some, which we are actually uh, uh, being pressed by in the fusion program because the transmission lines have to be straight and gravity will sag the 
the a horizontal run a little bit, so they have to be precisely aligned and set up. But our waveguide setup is going to be along the gravity gradient, so I think it might be a little bit easier to keep a straight section aligned. Uh, but there are issues near the surface where we have components to direct the beam in a different direction. And there's window components and there's manifolds to bring in gas flow uh, and access for diagnostics. So uh, on the surface, there uh, will be some engineering, but a lot of that's similar in the Fusion program to uh, set up diagnostics and monitoring. So, uh, the mechanical things I think will be seen in transmission in a superfluid. Of a millimeter beam. Carl? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand better how the water loop works. You know, after you've drilled and, and now you're in operation. So, presumably, you drill two, two holes, two boreholes. Yeah. How far apart do they need to be? And how does the water pass between them? And also, how much water is lost in the process? Uh, so, you know, do you need a a big water supply nearby. Well, it depends on how you design your heat transfer reservoir. Uh, there, uh, you probably could look at current experience with the EGS system. Some of them have bad uh, experience with the heat transfer reservoir. They haven't lasted as long. Uh, so that that's a part of the technology. As I said at the beginning, to to uh, uh, make. Uh, EGS geothermal system practicals, you have to advance the drilling and you have to advance the reservoir design. Uh, I primarily addressed the drilling part and I've indicated that the ability to draw, drill smaller holes uh, in the rock may contribute to uh, the reservoir formation and we'd be able to make smaller reservoirs if we go deep. Uh, uh, as far as the well spacing, uh, you know, it depends uh, on how far, uh, uh, you know, current thinking it has to be fairly large because you need a very, very large heat transfer reservoir. Uh, when I was looking at a set of wells uh, to build a 15 kilometer deep field, I was using 100 meter separation for the wells. So as a ballpark number and uh, it could last uh, many decades, the heat reservoir at 15 kilometers. Is it possible to, secure, to, 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 to continue? Is it possible to build a closed loop system for the for the water and just use a radiator type thing where the water the water just gets heated and recycled? Well, that's what I'm hoping. In, so you don't. So you're not you're not worried about the minerals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, you, that, you, that would be like a second generator, second generation radiator. And I'm hoping it could be closed loop, just like the old steam uh, radiators in buildings in the 1890s. You know, bring up steam, you go through a radiator, and then it goes back yeah. to the boiler. Yeah, I, I, I think ultimately something like that could be engineered. I could foresee it, but when I talk to people that are currently in the business, they're they're not. Uh, <laughs> Interested in that? Yeah. You know, that, uh, I guess something that do it is to have multiple small feeder. Yeah. Well, my concept for which are trying to like we drop the cost a factor of a hundred or whatever. Uh, that then you could drill many more wells and have real, less reliance. On, uh, and you know, in a geothermal system, you need to bring the heat up efficiently. So, if you, what goes down getting hot, if it comes up in a similar way, you'll dissipate the heat getting up. So, one way to address that is you have many smaller diameter wells because the surface area of a cylinder um, uh, ratio to volume gets smaller as the diameter goes up. So the volume to surface drops. So if you have smaller wells, like uh, six to eight inches to feed down, and you make a hundred of them, they go down spaced within a hundred meters of each other. So you 
and connect them at the depth, you know, by putting their being 90 degrees. And then have those wells feed one, so looking at a system that might have 25 wells injection feeding one well extraction, but the well extraction is twice the diameter of the inner wells. So you have all those wells coming down and feeding slowly, then they combine and they go to a larger diameter well, and all of a sudden the speed of extraction goes up, and on top of that, the ratio of surface to volume drops significantly. Uh, in a, a finite element simulation, I was showing it's possible to have the extraction about 85 to 95 percent efficient, and, uh, and and that would be one approach. And then you build many of these groups of extraction wells and injection wells in a field. And if you have a one kilometer square area, and you build about 100 to 120 injection wells, you could have a 100 megawatt thermal plant. Uh, fairly easily. And then when I looked at the heat conductivity loss over that volume, because there's a certain amount of energy stored underground uh, that you can take out, there'd be enough energy at depth, you know, beyond 15 kilometers, that the plant could run for many, many decades before you have to drill a new plant somewhere else. Wouldn't it be more efficient to go horizontally, horizontally drill once you get down to depth? Well, when you're teeth dropping. Well, it, uh, it, it's easier to drill vertically than horizontally, uh, and you don't need to go that far horizontally at when the temperature is over 400 degrees centigrade to get it. But a lot of the near surface concept uh, postulate you drill horizontally long, many kilometers, but they're dealing with low quantities of heat. I mean, they're drilling where the temperature is 100 or 200 degrees C, uh, and uh, they're not going to be powering efficient plants. There isn't that much heat very close to the surface. Most of the heat is down low. And the power flow in a solid goes by Fourier's law. It's the product of thermal conductivity and temperature breaking. The thermal conductivity rock is pretty slow. You know, the uh, surface uh, heat flow is about 65 milliwatts per square centimeter near the surface. So you're drilling horizontally and trying to extract heat at a very low power density. You know, the solar power density on a square meter average over 24 hours is about 250 watts. So the, and if you're near the surface within, you know, two or three kilometers, you're talking about milliwatts over square square. You're not going to get power. However, if you drill down to where the temperature is 500 degrees C and you work with a fluid at 400, you establish a heat gradient of 100 degrees, thousands of times more than your surface. So you can extract power density similar to what solar energy is impinging on Earth. Uh, if you go deep and establish that thermal gradient, and now you can run a real electric power plant, how we're used to, rather than some real uh, lower power system with these long horizontal wells that they're now looking at. You can bring you can power. Horizontal depth, but that horizontal, or, you know, not, not thermal wells at depth. Yeah, they could, but what, once you pass uh, 300 degrees C, you're getting a lot of energy on the way down over uh, uh, existing degrees. under you know, if you're drilling down to 20 kilometers, when you're a temperature over 300 C for 10 kilometers, that's actually better than a 10 kilometer horizontal. Well, it's only three kilometers deep vertically because we're going so deep. Why are you not breaking your volcano? Yeah, you could go near the volcano, but that's where. No, current... no, that's not what I asked. What's that? Why? You drill a hole yeah. in the hot magma. Well, we haven't quite gone that far, but, no, but yeah. you're getting close. We're going to get close, and it'll be interesting to get there for research purposes. <laughs> right, I'm going to be the guy that pulls the trigger. Power tron beam bringing 20 kilowatts per square centimeter will counter that magna and vaporize it. So once the gyrotron is on, <laughs> matter has no chance against intense energy. 
So I would, would be worried about that. And the pressure we would be generating by bringing down that power will be much higher than the pressure that's behind the magma. You know, this is similar to controlled uh, nuclear explosion underground back in the 50s, where you, they triggered weapons uh, tests underground and made tremendous um, chambers by intense amount of energy. The energy we can bring with a gyrotron is not quite as intense but if we run for a month, we could start approaching those energy uh, brought in with, within a microsecond by nuclear weapon. So this is a, you know, you have to change your thinking a little bit because we're now generating electricity, converting it to high power beam, and we're pumping it down in a controlled way where we could bring energy down below the surface greater than possible before, except by nuclear explosion. So I don't think a man that has a chance to get some character beam while it's on. And then uh, when it's off, you probably could quench it, you know, in a, in a native state of war. Great time, wow. great time. We have but limited time. It's already 1135. Jerry's been patient. Let's take him as the last question, and then we can go from there. When you're down 10 or 12, 15 miles, what is the weight? What is the vertical weight of the equipment? And what's the force? Well, that's a good question, because I've had, Mikhail, because you're looking at it, you know, if we're trying to uh, support a waveguide uh, 20 kilometers, it's not going to work. You know, uh, materials aren't just aren't there to, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, some steel or titanium near the surface, and then you're waiting a 20 kilometer way to waveguide. That is an engineering just issue. Inter issue. There, have, there, there is a yeah. fellow that has cheaper than material. There is a, there is a, uh, a patent out there by a, a fellow who's uh, uh, invented a spider network around the waveguide at uh, at distance to try and support the waveguide. But it is a challenge. Titanium, I think, is the strongest material to weight ratio. And if we played it with copper or higher conducting functions, I don't know how far that will go. But that I don't know. That's something uh, to be looked at more detail. But people have been calculating spider uh, structure around the waveguide to try to hold it uh, as you put down.